Hello and welcome. This presentation is about a real-time procedural generation system using the novel GPU WorkPress API. And for the beginning, I have to give an introduction to GPU work graphs and the idea is it's a novel API feature is that you have a compute kernel and you can create work items for another compute kernel from it. So for example, here we have a worker kernel and it gets work items from the work creator. And a work item uh, is associated with some kind of parameters. For example, in this case, you, uh, the job struct. And this would be a very simple work graph, but you can go more complicated. For example, the node B could then create uh, work items for node C or for node D, which create works item for itself. So this was a very brief introduction. You will get a more thorough one after the break by Max. Um, and let's get started with procedure generation. And I want to make a short list of existing procedure systems. So I have to include Houdini. Um, then there is Blender with its geometry nodes, and the most recent addition is Unreal Engine. They are currently developing the P their own PCG system. All right, so let's take a look at how and or rather where they, uh, these softwares um, generated geometry. So for Houdini and Blender, if you want to um, use the generated geometry for real-time rendering, you basically generate it on the CPU for the most part, then you have to store it to disk, to some polygon from it, you basically bake it, and then you load it later for rendering. And what Unreal Engine achieves with their system is that the generation happens in engine and you can basically skip this baking part to disk. And what we want to do today is we want to skip the CPU part and let the GPU generate everything that it also wants to render. So let's make a list of requirements and let's add the first requirement. We want to be GPU only. Next up, if we take a look at uh, this Unreal Engine PCG example, you can see that while we are dragging around this structure, the generation doesn't actually update. Only if we let go of the mouse button, it will take like a second or two for the generation to run and then we can see the result. And this is kind of annoying because while you're dragging, you don't know how the final scene will look like. So let's add to our requirements. We want to have instant updates when editing. Next up, let's take a look how artists can control the generation. So here, um, is you I want to demonstrate something that we call the, um, the parameters for the generation, the control parameters. And as you can see here, these three values influence the generation of this muffin. This could be more uh, complicated. For example, here we have a bounding box and this bounding box defines the shape of this bench. And if we manipulate this bounding box, it could also be, for example, for lying down, or we could um, manipulate how uh, the height of the back support. And we can go more complicated than, it, than that. For example, a polygon could define the whole shape of a building or so. So we also want to have our, uh, our system to have control parameters, so let's add it to our requirements. Next up, if we take a look at our um, of, of existing um, procedure generation systems, we can see that they all are based on node graphs. And what these node graphs do, they basically nodes receive control parameters and output control <laughs> parameters, and then these nodes are reusable, and the user can plug them together, these nodes, to generate a complex scene. And this is also what we want to do. We want to have a hierarchy of reusable nodes. All right, so uh, let's start with our first example. We want to generate this marketplace. And for this, we uh, went on a research trip to the Kobo Christmas market and observed that the basic shape of this market can be described as a polygon again. And from the corners of this polygon, there are paths leading towards the center of the market. And in between these paths, there are more interconnecting paths and in between these paths, there's something we call booth islands, or that there are the booths. And uh, so there we would like to place some fitting assets, for example, tents or market stalls or whatnot. And in the center of the market, there's a special area with a special asset, for example, a well or a tree or a statue. And um, what this layout um, looks like is very similar to something that's called the straight skeleton of a polygon. Um, by um, uh, Eichholzer, and if we take a look how it works is, so we have the initial polygon and then you shrink it. And while shrinking, you have to handle um, events. So for example, in this case, 
we shrunk a little bit, and now two points of the polygon merged into one. So that's the merge event. And the other event that can occur is the so-called split event, where the polygon will split into two. And for our market generation, we also have to handle these kind of events. So let's see how we do that. Um, so this is our example polygon, where we want to generate a marketplace uh, into. And we have a market node of a work graph, and it receives this polygon as input. And this is how it would look like in code. So we have the market node, kernel, and it receives an input record. And this input record is a struct containing the points of the polygon. And this means, this syntax means that uh, when launched, when this market is launched, we receive one thread group. And uh, because this thread group has 32 sets, we get one wave, basically. And what we do with the threads of this wave, we uh, assign one thread to one corner of the polygon and uh, compute when the next event will happen for that point. And uh, then we have to find out uh, what's the closest event. So we can do just use a wave intrinsic. So for example, in this case, it would be um, thread two or corner two. And then we can uh, find out, okay, we can actually shrink the polygon before handling anything. Okay, what we do now, we can um, write our, uh, some records for a node called path. So it should generate the paths for this first ring. And then we can make some space for these paths. And we can write uh, records for the booths islands. So let's take a look at uh, how this would look like in code. So uh, here we add some more outputs to our node for the path and the booth island nodes. OK, so let's take a look at how the Booth Island generates geometry, or how our whole system generates geometry. So here we would like to fill this quad control structure with market booths. And uh, one way to do this is to write to a draw list. And then later, uh, just uh, use execute interact and draw this draw list. And uh, for this, you would need some kind of, because everything runs in parallel, you would need like some kind of interlocked add and reserver slot in, a, in the draw list. You could uh, go a little more modern. You could write to a BVH instance list and then later um, build a TLS from that list, but it would be very similar. Or a more modern approach or more recent addition to work graphs are graphic leaf nodes, where you can directly draw from the um, work graphs to uh, using a mesh shader. All right, so these are all three options. OK, so we have now generated our first string. And now we are at a similar position as we were when we started generating. We have a polygon. We want to generate a market into it. So let's recurse. And this is how it would look like in code. So we add another output to our market node, which is to the market. And we have to additionally declare how deep this recursion can go in the worst case. OK, and now we can again write um, records for the booth island and for the path. And uh, now we can no longer uh, shrink the polygon because the first event happens, in this case, the split event. And what we do now, we, um, we said we had to have to split the polygon into two. So let's recurse again, but this time into two. And um, for the right half, it's really small. There's no more space for another ring of booth islands. So let's create the market center, in this case, um, um, a well. And for the other half, we still have space. We can add another ring, write our outputs, and conclude with a market center, in this case, a tree. And this concludes our market generation. Um, if you take a look at the straight skeleton again, we can see it's very similar. Um, in our actual implementation, we add a little bit of noise after each iteration um, to the points of the polygon, so it looks more natural. All right, so let's see it in action. Here we can see the rings generating. It's, uh, for the visualization, it actually um, runs in like one millisecond. And here you can see us dragging around a point of the polygon, and you can see the generation updating instantly to what we are doing. All right, so um, this um, fulfills our requirements so far, but there's more to it, because if you take a look here, there's something um, that I haven't mentioned so far. We actually generate garlands in between booth islands who have been generated independent from, from each other. So let's talk about how we achieve that. And that's um, 
a, sim, a feature that is similar in other systems. So we have this clip from Unreal Engine again. And here we can see in the red box that um, when this white structure intersects with something, Unreal Engine will generate this connecting stem. And for the blue box, it doesn't find any connecting, um, like any existing geometry, so it doesn't um, create anything. And this is something we call dependent generation. So the generating, um, uh, reacting to something that's already there, or reacting to other procedural geometry. So let's talk, get back to our garland example and talk about how we achieve it. Um, so here we have the connecting points for our garland. And we now have to find them uh, when running the generation. So we need some kind of spatial GPU data structure that is fast to create an update and to access. So we thought for a little bit. Wait, we already have that a ray tracing BVH. And um, so creating it is just a matter of issuing API calls, right? And we already established that we can write to a BVH instance list. So just let's do that. And here's how we do it uh, in a more specific way. So for these mm, uh, garlands, we create something which we call markers. And these markers are invisible when ray tracing for uh, lighting effects, for example. Uh, in, and we use BVH instance uh, flags for that. And we only activate the flag for the markers when we want to generate the garlands. And what we do is we shoot rays into the vicinity of um, these garland points, so something like this, <laughs> and uh, then we can generate the garland. All right, uh, we can do more with this uh, dependent generation idea with ray tracing. For example, we can generate um, IV on existing geometry. So let's talk a how, uh, about how we do that. So uh, we have an IV branch node, and it receives a transformation as input. And what we want now, we want uh, this IV branch now to generate IV onto an existing surface. And here's the loop uh, that IV branch um, runs. So first, uh, IV branch sh shoots rays into the growth direction approximately. Then um, based on the result, the transformation is updated. Then we draw um, assets, for example, you get the, the branch and the leaves. And then there's a random chance that this branch can split into two. And for that, we again use recursion. So let's see how this would uh, look like. So the IV grows onto the surface and then terminates at some point. And here's how this looks like in action. So here we drag around this transformation. And you can see when there's nothing to grow on, it will just grow downwards. And uh, when it finds the surface, it will grow along the surface. Uh, this is well. This is cool. This is still kind of boring. So let's add a parent to IV branch, uh, something we call the IV area, and IV area receives a bounding box as a control parameter, and uh, outputs a bunch of transformations for IV branch. Um, so here we want to fill a whole roof with IV, and you can see us dragging around the bounding box and now adjusting its scale. And what you will see in a minute or in a second uh, that we can, this house is also procedure generated, so we can also change its control parameter and the IV is also adjusting to it immediately. All right, um, uh, one last thing we did with the um, dependent generation, we generate cloud clutter everywhere, and you see it here. The, we use ray tracing to find like how bright a spot is. And based on the brightness, we place either mushrooms or grass, for example. And what some, there's also something here that I haven't mentioned so far. We can actually only, like we can say that we only have to generate the geometry for the current frame, right? The, the generation runs within a, like, within a frame, so we can only uh, or have a new possibility for optimization. We only have the generated geometry that influencing the current flame, frame. So in this case, we only create the ground clutter that's uh, inside the frustum. So let's add that to our requirements. We want to have cult generation. All right, so let's talk about performance. So here we have our test scene. And on the left side, we can see an overview where we cannot call any generation. We have to generate everything. On the right side, we uh, have a little smaller um, uh, scene, so we have to uh, generate less. And here are our timings. So you can see we run, our generation runs in this time. 
And for the uh, little smaller scene with the market, we, have, we are a little faster. And uh, you can also see here, um, we also generate a little less because uh, everything else was culled. But there's also uh, pretty terrible render timings, right? That like almost 30 milliseconds is absolutely in, uh, acceptable. Um, and well, what's the reason for this? It's the number of draw calls, right? Now uh, we uh, submit one draw call per generated object and don't use any instancing or whatnot. So we have to do this as we have to fix this. So let's add instance rendering as the last requirement for a system. Let's talk about how we achieve that. In work graphs, there's a special feature called, or special launch mode for nodes, which is called coalescing. And what this does is here we receive up to 256 draw asset records, and then can output up to a, a 256 asset records. But in the best case, we can condense, combine some draw calls using instancing. So in this example, what we would do, we um, sort this list, and then we can see, OK, we have to submit one draw call for the branches, one for the market uh, tens, and so on. Let's take a look at how much this improved it. And as you can see here, uh, the number of draw calls significantly reduced, uh, was reduced, and so did the um, render timings. So we have achieved uh, what we wanted. And also the generation times went down a little bit. All right, so this concludes uh, our requirements list. Uh, let's, uh, that's the only thing that's left to say is source code is and will be available on GPU Open, most part of it. We've already published uh, some parts of it, uh, so take a look. All right, so uh, in conclusion, work graphs plus ray tracing plus match shaders, cool scene. So thank you for your attention, and I'm open for questions. Alex. It is amazing, but why do you need to generate content that fast? I mean, it is like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what reason? I mean, I mentioned you can do it cult, so you only can like... Oh, sorry. Okay, he asked why I have to generate that quickly. <laughs> like, what's the point of it? So first, you can uh, do cult generation. You can only generate the stuff that's currently recurrent for, for the current frame, right? So you don't have to worry about culling because you only generate the stuff that, that's visible, right? Um, another reason would be real-time editing, right? I showed you where I edited the mark place. It's really annoying, like, if you would, like, drag it around, don't see what's happening, then let go, go get the coffee, and then come back and then see what the result is. You would want it to see immediately what's happening, right? Or an artist would want that. And of course, well, it's resource e efficient and stuff, right? So these are the reasons, okay. Maybe, yeah. Uh, if I understand correctly, your string skeleton implementation, you can shrink by the width of your market uh, with a market island node. Can that be extended just, or maybe it's implemented this way already, to <coughs> calculate the generic string skeleton of any simple polygon with a GPU implementation? Yeah, so. Um, Ah, sorry. Okay, uh, he's asking uh, whether I can use this implementation of the straight skeleton for any straight skeleton, right? So this specific implementation is optimized for polygons of 32 points or less, so one wave. But I'm confident that there could be something in there. So if you are willing to like make an implementation for it and maybe a paper, sure, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so for the mark, okay, he's asking. So I, I, in my examples, um, I only always had the grid size of 111, which is kind of counterintuitively or kind of bad for GPU programming, right? For the market, I mean, I guess you would agree that there's not really a point in generating a thousand markets at the same time, right? There's not really a use case for that. Um, and I, I also wrote in the paper that most of our generation, like the market alone doesn't occupy a GPU, right? But if you like, for example, the Ivy generation, also the first iteration of Ivy will not occupy the GPU, but if you combine all these generation things and let the Ivy 
splits and recurs and have this um, exponential growth, then it will at some point ex uh, occupy a GPU. Okay? Yeah, so what we could do right now is, so, ah, right, okay, so he's asking whether we could use, like right now we are generating everything every frame and it's kind of um, wasteful. And yeah, what we can do, I mean, the most basic thing we can do, we just click not generate, like we could just stop running the work graph and then use the draw list to just draw everything, right, that's the easiest thing. Um, I didn't get that. Ah, yeah. That's true, but um, so he's uh, he's saying like when I move the camera, I could like reuse some of the generation, right? Um, yes, I mean generation was so fast that we didn't even think about that. So yeah, you're right. No idea. Yeah, probably. Another thought here, and you can tell me whether you think this is up in the night or not, is in the context of the other two papers here about uh, content compression for GPU rendering, you can think of the decompression uh, as, as similar to the effort to generate this content, right? And, and you do that every frame without complaining about it. So, so you, you, can, you can think of this generation in that same way. Totally, yeah. So. Aaron. So uh, he's mentioning that uh, the, the scenes you can see here is very low poly, and he's asking whether, whether high poly stuff would be way more, like if any of the performance characteristic characteristics would change. So I mean, for the most part, we generate an instance list. And it doesn't matter if this instance has a million polygons or a hundred, right? It only matters for rendering, but we don't really optimize rendering here, right? That's not our worry. Um, but as you have seen, like we gener also generate, for example, the, the ground clutter, right? And that ground clutter has like 50 million triangles or so you can see here, yeah? Um, so no, it doesn't really matter, yeah. So Go ahead. Yeah, uh, so he's asking, like, because I'm generating everything on the GPU, you cannot have the classic, like, CPU knows about, for example, collision, and then handle, like, the, for example, a character walking up to a market booth, and I don't know, wanting, because everything runs on a GPU. I mean, the, 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 the tacky answer is to say, uh, well, then let this stuff also happen on a GPU, like, handle collision and stuff also on a GPU, right? And with Workrefs, I think we're one step closer to let that be a reality, so, yeah. Okay, great, Let, let's uh, thank Bastian one more time. <laughs>